bit far from satisfying, but that's all about to change. Let's try a little experiment, shall we? The film is one side. The technology is the other side. You'll be seeing a lot more of these. Go ahead and press the button in front of you to activate your console. She's getting away. And then the third side is the audience. Go. It's Leslie. And none of it exists without each other. You know, if one element is missing, there is no movie. There is no entertainment to be seen. If the audience isn't there making choices, being active, there is no movie. It doesn't get made. Oh, this could be great, right? I mean, right? I was asked the question whether uh, somebody, for example, Martin Scorsese would ever make, uh, be interested in making an interfilm, and would he allow someone to, quote, edit his, his uh, film? And, and my answer was probably, yeah. I think that um, there will always be um, films as we know them. And they, they said, so the audience is like the writers, sort of. They like writers. And I said, yeah. He said, great. Soon they'll be down like the directors. And they'll be shouting up. No, move a little to your left, and stuff like that. But I, you know, I can't remember. It was funnier when he said it, because it's uh, he was from Hollywood. When Bob called me one evening with this crazy, out of his mind uh, uh, dialogue as to this this concept. The image I always have is, you know, uh, in the old Star Trek, Spock played that three-dimensional chess. He always saw it in his cabin, and. Um, and writing in a film and conceiving of it is very much like what I imagine playing that kind of chess is. It's really three-dimensional. My first reaction was, you know, great, we'll talk about it in the morning because I just wanted to go back to sleep. Um, at which we met in the morning and Bob kind of not only laid out this concept of how we can, how we can make this work, but he basically had a whole uh, st structure um, in place as well, not to mention a, uh, a basic screenplay. The writing of this thing was, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's kind of like it's a, it's a writer's nightmare and it's a writer's dream at the same time. Because there are different, you know, as many as nine or twelve different things could be happening in real time on the levels of this movie. So all they had to do, the writing team, which were great, Ben Grant and Michael Schwartz and uh, Jeffrey Gurian and Elisa Tagger, what they had to do was they had to keep track of the voices of their characters. How would I react as the character in the moment of the scene? We'll have a drink later. She's into me. I can tell by the way I'm being completely ignored. All the basic rules of drama apply still. You've got to have good characters. You have to have a compelling story. It's obviously a much more complex one because you have to give all these options and you have to deliver on the options. But still, the structure and the characters and what it says and is it funny or is it not funny all still applies. I don't think anybody really knew what they were making except for the director. Um, maybe the, uh, the cameraman understood it, but I'm pretty sure no one else had any idea why we were doing what we were doing. We shot every night, night for night, at our offices. It was incredible. It was just a, a mind-opening experience. Our offices are down in Soho, um, this 11-story building. We used the whole first floor we turned into a sound stage, three stages, the party sequence that you see, the Professor Bob set. Do you realize he's the only man who's worked with both Otto uh, <laughs> Wagner? <laughs> yeah, okay, he didn't work with Otto Wagner. We used three hallways on three of the other different floors. Otto Otto Klemperer. We used the whole entry hallway in the building. No, right. This is what I wanted to say. We used the street. We shut off the block, did that. He's the only man who's worked with both Otto Preminger and Otto Klemperer. We did all the roof sequences on the roof of our building. We used two, two other apartments in the building to shoot the interiors of the bedrooms and everything like that. I mean, we owned this place for a week. There was always kind of that scratching your head questioning, well, you sure that you know what you're doing type of thing. And we knew what we were doing, but I fairly certain nobody else did. The hardest thing about the project was just trying to get a grip on what the hell was going on with all these different, um, you know, three possibilities of every scene. I don't know if difficult is the uh, exact right word. It was very different and unusual, and I liked that challenge. So when you work in a film, everything is mixed up anyway. But here, uh, people expected you to be following all the different eventualities. Okay, we're going to do the elevator scene alternate two. And we would just have to remember that that's when, you know, you know, I get a gun in the head instead of a cheese ball in my face. And there were times I would go, okay, is this my story or, or is this Mark's? And where am I coming from then in his situation? I didn't even bother to keep track. I had no idea what was going on. Why should I bother? I'm an actor. Do cattle know what's happening to them? I mean, he was a VJ on MTV. 
And, and what we found during the shooting is all of that training that Kevin had of treating a camera like a best friend was the absolute perfect training for the premiere inner film well, episode. Because he, he knows how to talk to it like it's a human being, so he instantly brings the audience in. But what let me say about Bob is that he's, he's, he's great to work with. He's very happy, very upbeat the whole time. He was, he was the most, most happy, pleased man I'd ever seen in my life up to that point. And then I took a recent trip to a psychiatric ward as a part of an outreach program, and there are other people who are happier. But the, all I mean to say is that Bob is very pleased, and the way that he works is tremendous. You know, it's like, what, no hair in the gate? Okay, next scene. I love that. The leading female role is played by Colleen Quinn, who's a wonderful actress from Broadway and television, a lot of soap opera work, but just wonderfully charming, and she's great. I had read the script and thought it was rather unusual and jumped all over the place. I did not know that it was audience remote controlled until much further into the process. The villain is Mark Metcalf, uh, who you may remember as Niedermeyer from Animal House, but he's great, plays Richard Hewitt. It's always harder when you have less money, and it's always harder when uh, uh, people are learning, and people were learning in this um, about the form, how to tell the story. Um, Bob was learning about film, I think, and uh, uh, everybody was sort of learning on the job so that makes it harder it also makes it more uh, makes it interesting Dad! what are you doing here am i like leslie no um and what i'm excited about with the film that i've seen so far is i definitely had an idea about her in terms of her earnestness and her naivete and that she really believes what she's doing i really like her she's a she had been described to me as the perils of pauline by bob so i thought about that a lot that uh she's trying to maintain her composure in non-composed situations <laughs> colleen was very poised just always extremely professional you know just i guess because she's been working on on soap operas just that the idea that you know go and do it again just uh, the most remarkably well poised person i think i've ever seen kevin i had to suppress myself from laughing while we were doing scenes. That was rather difficult. I was glad we had a couple takes sometimes so I could see what he was going to do. And she, she only kicked me twice and I deserved it, both times. Colleen was sweet and really pretty and nice and, re and, and fun to work with. Mark and I got more of a chance to talk because we had late night shoots together that had some more spare time so we talked about various things and I knew of his work um, and he was he was swell. It was a real pleasure at, to work and to get to know him. Mark, too, is uh, just a, a bastion, a tower of, of professionalism. Kevin, I didn't really work with that much, but he seemed very funny. He smiles all the time. He might need some professional help. I don't know. Like when he got the mace in his eyes. I, you know, they were begging him, you know, Mark, we'll just do it with water. It'll just, we'll, maybe a little glycerin. It'll be just a little bit of stagecraft. He said, no, that's not the way I worked. It's not the way we did it in the Animal House. We're taking the real mace this time, and just and he delivered all of his lines. When a lesser man would have wretched. I wrote those three segments so that it wouldn't really make much difference where you came into them. They're all sort of like Muzak in a way. I mean, Richard's music is very much like the cheesiest Muzak you can imagine. Good evening, officer. But in a way, Jack's music, which is sort of like fake heavy metal, is also Muzak because it's, it's just completely cliched. And it really doesn't have a structure to it. It's just bashing and thrashing, and wherever you come into it, it doesn't make any difference. The music was great. I got such a hoot out of the music. Is there going to be a soundtrack? Because it seems like, I mean, can you get the album in stores or something? I don't know. I'll talk to to Joe about that. I mean, there isn't one note in the score that's, that's serious or meant to be taken seriously. And there's something very liberating about that. I like the music a lot. Country Joe and the Fish, right? No, who was that? Who made the music? Who was it? Joe Jackson, that's right. I don't know these modern people. One of the reasons I got involved with this was because it was something new and because it seemed like it was fun. And uh, I think whenever you get an opportunity to be involved in something new, you might as well be in on it, even if it sort of goes the way of 3D glasses and 
odorama or whatever. I loved it. That really hit me when I saw it for the first time because obviously we did not have the music when we were filming and I think it added so much to it. I think it's really great. The main thing about the score that was different for me is doing something completely electronic, which I haven't done much of, where I've played everything myself. And that was really because I felt like uh, this film was, was like playing a big video game. I don't have a problem with the fact that um, the audience is going to change this thing every time it's shown and that it, that's going to change the music too. I just hope that everyone sees it more than once so they get to hear as many of the different bits as possible, that's all. The end. Because of this new technology, this new media, what you get to do is, instead of just thinking, why did he say that to her? Why did that happen? You can change it. Don't just sit there. Change it. You know, you decide. It's up to you.